This is the daily briefing of the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office. We're live on all social media platforms, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So please like and subscribe across all our platforms and to my personal platforms at Asher Westrop. It really helps to spread the message. Now you can start submitting questions in the chat and I'll get to as many as I can at the end of the briefing. Now, last night, the Israeli Air Force targeted a number of Hamas terrorists who were operating in an UNRWA school in the town of Nuzirat in central Gaza. Did you hear about it? Well, the IDF announced the strike in a press release, but it attracted very little media attention, and it's easy to understand why. Hamas uses UNRWA facilities so often that it is no longer considered to be any sort of news. In addition, the idea that UNRWA is an asset utilized by Hamas is in reality an uncomfortable truth that many simply prefer to ignore. There was more UNRWA news three days ago that everyone also ignored. The IDF received intelligence that Hamas and Islamic Jihad were using UNRWA's Gaza headquarters as a military base. The intelligence was good. The IDF raided the complex and captured Hamas terrorists who tried to escape. Now, what the IDF found inside UNRWA's headquarters was truly remarkable. Drones, war rooms used for surveillance operations, rockets, machine guns, mortars, bombs, and grenades, all inside UNRWA's headquarter facilities. Here's something else that's incredible about the Hamas takeover of this UNRWA headquarters, is that the head of UNRWA, Philippe Lazzarini, said nothing about it. Lazzarini didn't say a word about how Hamas took over UNRWA's headquarters in Gaza and turned it into a military base. In fact, at around the same time that the IDF was uncovering a Hamas military base at UNRWA's headquarters in Gaza, Lazzarini was begging UNRWA's donors to give more money to UNRWA. The same is true for the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. He had nothing to say about the fact that Hamas was using UNRWA's headquarters as a military base. Instead, he begged UNRWA's donors to give more money to UNRWA. Now, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said something unbelievable. He said, and I quote, UNRWA is one of the greatest factors providing hope and stability across a troubled region, end quote. Now, nine months after the October 7 massacre, after all we've learned about how UNRWA is a front for Hamas, it should be clear, UNRWA provides no hope and no stability. UNRWA exacerbates despair and incitement. UNRWA is an obstacle to peace. UNRWA teaches Palestinians that their conflict with Israel should continue until there is no Israel. UNRWA perpetuates a forever war, and UNRWA's mandate is to tell the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Palestinian refugees from 76 years ago that they get free health care and education, courtesy of European-American donations, right up until the point that they receive the right to immigrate to Israel and change the name of the country to Palestine. Frankly, it's absurd. What donors would want to pay for these ideas? UNRWA exists in order to make a resolution of this conflict, frankly, impossible. You can have UNRWA or you can have peace, but you can't have both. There cannot be a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict if UNRWA continues to exist. So let's have the courage to say it clearly. UNRWA should be completely dismantled. Whatever services it provides to Palestinians should be provided either by the Palestinian Authority, the Jordanian government, or by the myriad international aid agencies that do not have terrorists on their payroll. And now speaking of that, another story that you may have missed, earlier this month, the Israeli Foreign Ministry sent a letter to UNRWA Chief Philip Lazzarini that lists 108 UNRWA employees who are known Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists. The Israeli Foreign Ministry demanded that these 108 employees be fired immediately. And we should all be asking some pretty simple questions. How are there so many terrorists on the UN payroll? Will these 108 terrorists be fired? Or will they continue to receive money from UNRWA? And why is it so hard for so many people to accept the truth about UNRWA? All right, at this point, I'll be happy to take some questions from our viewers who are watching live on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Robin on Instagram live asks, is UNRWA still in operation? Are there still people drawing paychecks? And if so, what are they doing? Has the UN suspended them or punished them in any way thus far? 
Well, Robin, thank you so much for asking that question. And frankly, as I've just mentioned here, UNRWA is very much still in operation, very much still being defended by Secretary General Antonio, Antonio Guterres, by uh, the UNRWA head, Philippe Lazzarini, and so many others who say that UNRWA is the only solution and the status quo must be maintained, despite the fact that its 76-year-old mission continues to, frankly, be a failure. They are continuing to support a status quo that is misaligned with the reality of the situation in Gaza and for Palestinians in general. But the idea that they can return as refugees to a land that simply does not exist anymore and to the modern state of Israel and try and take back some part of a country that doesn't exist and remove Israel from the equation is frankly ludicrous. Israel is here. Israel is here to stay. Israel is not going anywhere. And no matter what the future holds, for any Palestinians, uh, for any people uh, in this region, it will not be the removal of the nation of Israel. So yes, UNRWA continues to still exist. Yes, UNRWA continues to operate. But as we've called for here at the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office, this reality is misaligned with what is occurring on the ground and needs to be changed so that others who are more adept at dealing with this situation can actually help to find a reasonable solution for Palestinians on ground. We received this question via Twitter direct message. In the aftermath of the near assassination of former President Trump, there have been a proliferation of anti-Jewish conspiracy theories online. Do you have any thoughts on this and what can be done to combat such hatred? Well, I'll start by doing a, a bit of a plug for the State of a Nation podcast with Anon Levy, where we spoke with uh, Isabella Taborowski just recently about some of the ancient hatreds, blood libels, and histories of hatred and anti-Semitism across the world around the Jewish people. This is nothing new. When uh, societies struggle through difficult times, it has become a common uh, activity in the West, in the East, beyond and around the world to blame the Jews. Uh, why this is? Well, that is a deeper question that can be answered here in a daily briefing, but I can assure you that this is nothing new. And unfortunately, no matter what atrocities and horrors occur throughout the world, whether it be attempted assassination attempts, whether it be wars, whether it be famines, uh, you know, this is a hatred as old as the Jewish people itself and something we must continue to fight and combat. Uh, you know, as a Jewish people, as a, the, the, the people of Israel and beyond the, the diaspora and the Jews around the world, it is critical that we stand together at these times, that we define and defend the truth and the reality of the situation as it stands, we don't fall prey to these conspiracies as we've seen in our past, what can happen when we allow them to proliferate. We must not just take this lying down. We must work together from a grass grassroots position, from positions of power, from wherever we may be to push back against these sort of ludicrous and baseless conspiracy theories. And we will continue to do so just as we do here at the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office, where we'll continue to fight for the true narratives that are occurring throughout the world. Itai on Instagram Live writes, has Israel given a deadline to Hezbollah to back away until it will get backed away by force in order for the safe return of the North's citizens to their homes? Look, the fact of the matter is that the situation in Israel's North is incredibly complex and incredibly difficult. As we've stated here in the past, Hezbollah stands right by Israel's borders with hundreds of thousands of rockets, drones, missiles and all sorts of other uh, weapons targeted straight at Israel and its people. And while it is critical that Hezbollah move back behind the Tani River, behind uh, the UN uh, Security Council Resolution 1701 mandated position uh, of the Litani River of the Blue Line, so give a buffer zone, you know, when it comes to creating concrete deadlines for these things, it's nearly impossible to truly say. Israel is trying its best to back Hezbollah off, or it will be backed off if they don't do so on their own. And the line that we stick to here at the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office because it is a fundamental truth. That being said, the key protection and goal for Israel and its government is to ensure the protection of the Jewish people, of the Israeli people here, to try and return these 60,000 displaced peoples to their homes safely, so they can be there safely and securely. And as it stands right now, with a militant group on the border with hundreds of thousands of rockets aimed at them, it is simply not the time to do so. What happens into the near future remains to be seen, uh, but it's something we will be watching closely because the situation as it stands, the status quo as it stands, simply is not tenable. This question comes from Sarah, who responded to our Instagram stories. 
Uh, what is the situation with the humanitarian aid going into Gaza? Are the border crossings still open? How much is going in? And what are Israel's priorities in dealing with the humanitarian situation in Gaza at this time? Sarah, uh, thank you for asking this question. In our latest reports we're receiving from Kogat uh, indicate that they are attempting to clear the backlog at the Karim Shalom crossing. They're looking towards improving medical services into Gaza, uh, improving sanitation and facilities into Gaza, and doing certainly far more work to help the Gazan people than Hamas are doing as their supposed de facto government there within the Strip. Uh, you know, just yesterday we saw 211 trucks enter uh, Gaza via uh, enter Gaza via crossings. It, it is endemic on Israel and it, you know to continue to do this sort of work because they understand the humanitarian needs on the ground and they are achieving this. But as we've said so many times in the past, with a backlog still uh, building up along the borders and along these crossings, Israel can only do so much. The distribution mechanisms by the likes of UNRWA and others who are supposed to be managing these operations are now failing to do so, make it almost impossible for Israel to do you know, more than it can to try and provide humanitarian care, to provide sufficient food, uh, to provide sufficient medical resources. And yet it does manage to do so. We just saw reports showing that over 1.2 billion pounds of food aid have been provided to the Gaza Strip since the start of the war. I mean, that's a staggering statistic and proves that there is more than enough aid available and ready. It just simply needs to be distributed. And uh, COGAT and other organizations within Israel are doing what they can to try and facilitate that. We have time for about two more questions. I'm watching the uh, Instagram live stream. There's a lot of people asking questions about the hostages. Where are the hostages? What do we know about them? What What do you What can you share with us on this subject? Uh, and unfortunately, when it comes to the hostages, as it stands right right now, we don't particularly have any new information. You know, as the uh, ceasefire negotiations continue uh, with Hamas, uh, you know, moving back and forth, there are all sorts of conversations about returning the hostages. And really, that is the clear message that we're trying to give here, that we need to bring them home now, that we need to get these hostages uh, back to Israel. As it stands, we are not entirely sure what the status of any individual hostages are. You know, we still have uh, not had the Red Cross be, uh, provide access, be provided access to these hostages to be able to see uh, what stat that status they're in or to be able to provide any of that information uh, to Israel. We don't really know uh, what's happening on the ground inside Gaza with them. But all we can do is to continue to keep the pressure up uh, to ensure that we are fighting day and night to get those hostages returned, as that really is the key goal right now, the 120 that are still being held with inside Gaza right now. I'll say that number again, 120 still held inside Gaza that need to be returned as a precondition to any sort of uh, negotiations that are happening uh, with Hamas or anyone else in the Gaza Strip and to move forward. Uh, the situation, again, I've said this too many times today, but it seems to be the reality at the moment. Is simply untenable and it needs to be changed. We need to get these hostages back home. As we have more information, we'll of course bring it to you and bring it to light uh, as much as we can. But for the time being, that's all we can say on the matter for the hostages. Our last question today comes from Rachel on Twitter who writes, the Paris Grand Synagogue rabbi says there's no future for Jews in France. Do you think the Jews in Paris should leave and come to Israel or stay and fight? Frankly, uh, I'm not sure that I, I agree with the rabbi there because I think a country such as France with, France with such a deep uh, and detailed history with the Jewish people should not be so quick to forego that history of uh, Jewish connection community with inside the country uh, and you know, be willing to forgive and forego what, uh, what could be happening uh, you know, within that community. Look, this is a complex situation because it is obviously so critical that we have Jews in Israel, those who make Aliyah, those who are already here helping to fight for the Jewish people and fight for the Israeli people inside the country. That being said, Jews have had a broad and diverse history around the world, certainly in France, uh, in, in the UK, in, in Spain, all throughout Europe, in the Americas, in Australia, South Africa, all across the world, Canada, wherever it may be, Jewish diaspora communities are a critical part of the Jewish experience and the Jewish connection to the world. And we shouldn't be so ready or quick to try and forego that connection. So again, whatever country you may be talking about, your role in the diaspora, or whether you've been listening uh, to our briefing today from inside Israel, your roles are critical to help build your communities, to help strengthen the voice of the Jewish people, to be representatives of the Jewish people around the world, to help fight against this sort of anti-Semitism, conspiracies, blood libels, hatreds that may occur against 
Israel or the Jewish people anywhere around the world, it is imperative on everyone listening, whether you be Jewish or not yourself and simply a supporter, a Zionist, a supporter of Israel and the Jewish people, it is critical that you help to fight that fight at the grassroots level in a position of power, wherever you may be, because this is not the time to be shrinking violence. This is not the time to stick our heads in the sand. This is the time to stand up as Jewish people and to fight for our rights as a community, our strength as a community, and to rally together. And uh, I think that message is critical to what we're doing here at the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office. All right, well, that is all the questions we have time for today. I will reiterate how important it is to please like and subscribe to everything we do, whatever platform you're listening, across multiple platforms. It is so important that you help us get this message out, help us spread it far and wide, you know, share, retweet, repost wherever you can, because this message is so important for the people of Israel, for the Jews around the world, and for all supporters of Israel and the Jewish people. I just want to thank you so much for watching. watching. I've been Asher Westrop Evans. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Drop a comment below. Don't forget to like, share, and hit subscribe to stay updated with our latest content. Until next time, stay informed and inspired. This is Dijabnik signing off.